Sometimes we feel like doing nothing, sitting on the grass and thinking about the blue skies, um, pretty much like you have it here. And maybe there is something we are going to do in the future, but as of now we have to continue rolling as we have plenty of other things to see. We are actually going to finish today the story of the Rusins as they are, like many groups, divided into smaller pieces, so to speak. So here on the map you have in the corner the Polonine. In the Polonine you have the so-called Boikos. But if you go from the Polonine directly west, there are low mountains called Low Beskid. And there's another group of the Rusins living there called the Wemko. So we are heading towards the main town there called Svidnik, but on the way we have Medzilaborce. And there you will find an art gallery dedicated to the most famous Rusin, most famous Wemko in the world today, Andrei Varhola, known better as Andy Warhol. So here we are and two little issues. About one we knew beforehand, he is not really from here, he was already born in Pittsburgh, his parents come uh, from the vicinity. So when asked where he's from, where are his roots, he would say nowhere. He wasn't really proud of the place unfortunately. So it's a bit of a stretch to actually say the art gallery is in the place where he's from. Well, doesn't matter, stretch or not, art gallery brings some life to the region, which is great. Another thing is they did not allow to take photos or make videos. So I took a couple at the entrance and couple inside illegally, so to speak. But if you are there, do have a look. It's a very interesting art gallery. Look him up on the internet. He was also a very interesting person. Those famous soups, they're going to come back later on for a moment. So unfortunately, this is pretty much it. But I think even such a footnote was worth it. But now on to Svidnik. So in Svitnik they also have a skansen. And I guess you know by now, if there's a skansen, we are there as well. And that's the main reason why we're here for a moment. A second, there's supposedly one of the most beautiful wooden churches in all of Slovakia here in the skansen. But I think we're going to see today two which are not in a skansen. They're in the actual villages plus they're on the UNESCO list as well. But now that we're in Wisconsin, anyway, let's have a little walk around, shall we? All right, all right, let's make it truly little. I know that you have by now enough of the Skansens. I'm very sorry, I never have enough. But then again, aren't those cottages simply cute? So let's have a look or two. The only thing that wasn't cute, unfortunately, not very good weather this time around. But there is a place I am going to stop for a little more because we found something very important and uh, rather unique. A sawmill. And I mean literally what it says. It's a sawmill. Today it doesn't look like much. But believe me when I tell you, this is pretty much the um, software of the day. As in, if you own a sawmill, you're pretty much the Bill Gates of the region. If you're a peasant and you own one, you're the most, uh, you're the wealthiest peasant in the village. But usually, because that was very good money, it was owned by the nobles. So here, the mill part means the whole system is powered by water. And think of it like this, water back in the day was electricity. Very few of them survived, so that was an interesting find. But without any further ado, let's go to the main topic of the Skansen for us today. It is not simply dramatically positioned at the top of the hill almost, at the top of the Skansen, but it's also a classical Greek Catholic wooden Wemco church. So entering, let's have a bit of theory. You have to enter through a gate. As you can see, there's kind of a wooden fence around. This is the barrier between the Sacrum and the Profanum. So now we enter what can be considered sacred ground. And sometimes you will find the bell tower separate. Now this is not the bell tower because it's simply too small. But says something that you might find in other places. Here the bell tower is at the very front of the church. And that's what you're seeing right now. 
and here is the classical part of it. It is kind of divided in three parts. So you've got the bell tower first, then you've got the nave in the middle, and then the holy part, the presbyterium. The base is a square, so it's three times squares. You can see those little bulbs at the top. If they're small, that's very orthodox. You may also find them bigger then they are copies of the Baroque. In the end, Greek Catholics would mix both West and East in terms of architecture. But now let's enter the church itself. And mind you, for a long, long time, there was division between men and women. So women would sit here in the back and in the front, men would sit. Pretty much like you have till the very day in Orthodox synagogues. But the most famous piece about Eastern churches is that they have something called Iconostas. And here you've got it right in front of you. So I'm not going to go into details here anymore, but let me tell you one extra thing. If you were wondering if the tower at the front was really for the bell, yes it was. You're going to see empty space now where the bell should be, but let's see what happens in the future. But now more institutions that were important. Here the fire brigade would be, and there were still some old school fire brigade uh, trucks, so to speak. There was also a school, in case you were wondering if we are with the Rusins, look at the alphabet here. Now the coat of arms shows you, it's from Czechoslovakia, 2030s, so not even a hundred years ago, that would be the classroom. But let's leave the skansen. In case you're wondering, I am working very hard. I don't even have time to eat halushki properly. But uh, before we go, last but not least, a bit of infantilism. Okay, <laughs> so we are leaving the skansen because the true gem is next to Svitnik in a little village called Bodrujal, the church of Saint Nicholas. And it truly is a gem because A, in the setting sun, it looks beautiful, mystical and so on and so forth. But B, we were lucky. There was a lady there and she took us inside. Back in the previous church we had some theory. Now let's go straight inside, not a skansen, but a living, breathing church. Here's a date to show you it's old. And here you still have the bells to show you it's a living, breathing church. Now those ropes here are not simply for show, you have to pull them to ring the bell. And the lady, we can say literally and metaphorically, pulls the strings here. She's actually very upset with the Orthodox Church because they use electricity to ring the bells. That's a scandal. Basically, she is a character. For example, she said, only 60 people live in the village, 30 are Roma, so they don't care about religion, and the other 30, 12 are Greek Catholic, 18 are Orthodox. That's another scandal, she would say, the proportions. But with her husband, I think 40 years now, they care about the church. So let's say it's quality over quantity. And the church itself is spectacular. For example, here you have 17th century or 18th century uh, polychromy straight on the wood. And uh, with one of my favorites, this is what's awaiting you if you're a sinner. So maybe people could not read or write, but they definitely understand such imagery. There's also a beautiful iconostas. So have a look at it and then have a look at something else. The famous soups, for example, look at the symmetry and repeated imagery. Supposedly, that thing, which is very Andy, that's the influence of his youth, of his Greek Catholic background. And last but not least, we were invited behind the iconostas, which is not common, that's usually reserved for priests only. Mm -hmm. But the lady was so nice as to show us that place as well. Back in this council, I promised two churches, we didn't have time for the second, but this one was enough. It was a great way to finish the story of the wooden churches of the Rusin culture. But you may ask, looking at this setting sun, what did we do bef between the Skansen and the visiting the little church? Well, there's kind of a pillar here in the background. And I think you can hear the bells, right? So let's go down to that pillar. Let's see what's happening there. 29th of August 44 was the official beginning of the Slovak National Uprising. So this is today and it's officially 
a national holiday. Um, pretty much everything is closed, including many restaurants. So for us, it's going to be a bit of a difficult issue, but there are going to be celebrations. And already the very beginning for a pole is a, is a little shocker because the celebrations in the city of Svidnik are under a huge Soviet monument. So once again, we go back kind of a boomerang really to the issue of the monuments to the liberating Soviet Union and the Red Army. Anybody who hasn't seen the episode 6 about the war and the Slovak national uprising, do watch it as it's going to give you uh, more details, more backgrounds to understand what's going on. But here, the monumentalism of this monument is way over the top. And we're actually going to see it properly uh, in a moment or two. But first, let's deal with what's going on here. There is a manifestation because of the anniversary of the beginning of the uprising, yes. But first thing I thought, why is it in front of a monument to the Red Army? I found it interesting. So I started listening to what people talk about. And of course there were partisans and so on, but there was a lot about the Red Army and the Soviet Union. Considering it's the anniversary of the uprising, there was little about the uprising. So I started looking at the people around me. So let me show you with freeze frame a couple of interesting types. So here you have a couple with the typical far right imagery on their t-shirts. Here you have some gentlemen who are kind of sad, big, definitely on steroids and of course the typical shaved heads and one more shaved head, this time with another interesting bit, suspenders. You are looking at far right. So I kept on listening and after all the uh, kind of melancholic music and so on and so forth, you had this gentleman coming up with a microphone saying that um, thank you very much for coming, blah blah, but that he's kind of upset because he asked many organizations and many uh, parties to come and celebrate with them, but nobody wanted to join in. Why am I telling you about it all? Because I believe that context is pretty much everything. If you just randomly arrive to such a spot, you may be thinking, oh my god, all Slovaks are Nazis. No, it's a manifestation that's completely on the side. Nobody from the officials wanted to join in. And when I say it's on the side, it's not inside the town. My guess is they didn't get permission to have um, the celebrations at the monuments inside town, um, at the monuments of the uprising itself, because that's not a monument to the uprising, it's a monument to the Red Army, Soviet Union. Or maybe that's something else still. There were people who had t-shirts saying, Ja druk Putina, I am a friend of Putin. So that may be another thing altogether. That may be modern Russian propaganda. It is no um, secret today that Putin for many years was and is supporting the European far right. When I say European, people here are not only Slovaks, there are plenty of Czechs. My guess is also many Russians. And that may be the reason why they are gathered at the monument to the Soviet Union. Not because they didn't get permission to be anywhere else. That's the point to be here and not anywhere else. Plus, if you think it's a big manifestation, think about it for a second. One of the most important days in the national Slovak calendar, start counting. It's what, 300 people? And that's not only Slovaks. Plenty of them are from other places. That's actually a very small group. Of course, you may wonder what is extreme right doing at a monument to communism? Well, I explain it like this. Totalitarian system is a coin. Coins have two sides, left and right. But still, it's one coin called totalitarian systems. People kind of fix their gaze on words left and right. That's not the important piece. The important piece is the word extreme. And my guess is, all of the above, that's what you're looking at right here. So was there anything positive about it? Actually there was. Some of them came in some really cool cars. 
but we are actually here for a different type of motorized vehicles. We are in Svidnik not only because of the Skansen, but because of the Dukla Pass. And there was plenty going on here during Second World War. We are actually going to visit some of the numbers on the map, starting with a little war museum in Svidnik. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on the point of view, because of the manifestation that we saw a moment ago, we didn't have time to visit the museum properly meaning it's small well that's pretty much what you see at the moment but it's packed with info and a lot of very interesting photos so that's going to help me in the future with the story and to lay the background for the story geography low beskid as the name implies is low but it's still mountains and they're forested so the passes here were very important and the dukla pass is the biggest and lowest of them all so for hundreds and thousands of years it was a very important place for example for trade now in number, episode number 6, I told you that when they were preparing the uprising, they wanted to claim the Dukla Pass quickly so that Soviet Union can come through it and help the uprising. And that part of the plan failed. But the uprising as such began and the Czechoslovak army along with the Red Army were nearby in southeast Poland. So in the end the decision was made, the uprising needs help and the Dukla Pass has to be taken. So beginning of September, the fight for the pass begins. And the idea was to take it in four days. It lasted for two months. We are now at the pass itself, right at the border with Poland. And this is a monument cemetery of the Czechoslovak soldiers. One of the reasons it took two months, those people were already by the time very tired. Most of the brigades were missing people and of course Germans had time to prepare um, the defenses. So around you you are going to see plenty of graves, a lot of names because there were a lot of victims. When you take the dead from both the Czechoslovak and the Soviet army it is 13,000. But when you take the dead, the wounded and the missing all together it's 88,000 people. 88,000 people lost their lives and health in two months trying to get across one little pass. The numbers are absolutely stunning, but those are just statistics. And then you start thinking about the place itself, about the forest, how much horrible fighting there must have been, how many dead bodies there must have been lying around the place in September, October 44. But some people did survive and some of them became very important for a post-war Czechoslovakia. For example, the main general of the Czechoslovak army called Ludwig Svoboda. Now the monument as such was also uh, rather monumental, although this is not the size of the other. You can see who's the boss around here, so to speak. But also be below the monument there was kind of a crypt of an unknown soldier, I guess, and there were interesting images on the crates. Some of them showing you the uprising or the Dukla pass itself, but finally some women appear and get recognition as military medics. Um, so that's nice. But generally speaking, that's pretty much it. That's the main monument in the pass itself to the Czechoslovak army. But when you walk around the woods, you will find plenty of other things spread around as the front line was, of course, wider. So they also built a big tower to kind of take it all in. But unfortunately, as you can see, it was closed. Let's go back for a moment more to the Soviet monstrosity. Well, there's actually one uh, reason why it is monumental and it makes sense. Just like the previous, the Czechoslovak one, it's not simply a monument, it is also a cemetery. Behind the cross there, you do have um, people buried. And because it was such an important battle, because it took so long, it was so bloody, with so many people who died, well, it does make sense to actually build something big, monumental for them. But here's another interesting detail. I found some info that most people, most soldiers, although officially Soviet, were ethnic Ukrainians and Kazakhs. Well, we think very often Soviet Union, Russia. Well, no, it was a huge mix of a lot of people and Stalin had a talent for sending to their deaths people from groups he didn't like. 
whether it's a urban legend or actually true i cannot tell but um, considering stalin's talents it makes quite a lot of sense what leaves no room for doubt is the placement of the monument it is spot on you have some beautiful views all around and it's also perfectly visible from everywhere but two extra curiosities here you have a girl enthusiastically welcoming a soviet soldier but somebody painted a question mark so i understand it as was the enthusiasm real and to finish the story of the monument beautifully eroded hammer and sickle let's leave it at that and let's see an extra cemetery because there's one group missing right what about the germans well here we have soldiers from the german army and mind you the statistics are also horrible 50 to 70 thousand dead wounded and missing but that's another interesting question how do you commemorate the um, the bad guys because well they started it right so they're the bad guys but on the other side they're humans so they also deserve to be buried in a proper cemetery well classical no big monuments of heroism crosses names in a book and a quote telling us to commemorate victims of all wars this is what's left of the great army of the third reich now the quote mentioned remembering victims of all wars right well it wasn't only the second here first world war was also here and the first thing i noticed there's practically nothing in public space i think People generally don't know about the Dukla Pass and how important it was in the Second World War, but when you come to the very place, you'll see it in public space. There are expositions, there's information, those monuments and cemeteries that we saw, you'll find it here. First World War, in public space, it's completely invisible. You do have, like you see here, in the museum in Svitnik, information and photos, and there are a number of other places where you will find something about it, but there's no First World War in public space. There are no monuments, there are no trails commemorating um, the battles and so on and so forth. And honestly, I find it strange as plenty was going on. 1914, there was a huge Russian offensive, they took the pass. Then counter-offensive, 1915, on the side of Austro-Hungarian Empire and the German army. Then again an offensive, 1916, by the Russians, and again counter-offensive. And I found some statistics that by late 1915, only one year and a half of war, when you take the general side of the Eastern Front in the mountains here, both sides, the dead, the wounded, and those who deserted, one million people, one million. I know that not all of them were dead, but still, the numbers are completely mind-blowing. And when I say deserted, that's another interesting issue. In the Austro-Hungarian army, many Czechs and Slovaks felt sympathetic with the Russian Empire. And in the Russian army, you had plenty of Poles who would consider Austro-Hungarian Empire not that bad at all. So there were plenty of desertions as well from both sides. But even if they don't die in a fight, well, they're going to die of hunger. Whatever, I'm absolutely sure. You go today to the Dukla Pass, to the mountains around, with a shovel, you start digging, you will eventually find something that you maybe don't want to find. But of course, there are plenty of cemeteries as well. So in episode number 12, when we visited the huge grave of Stefanik, I mentioned a very important Slovak architect, Jurkovic. He was given the task of preparing the um, cemeteries for the victims of the First World War. Ironically, practically all of them, if not all, are on the Polish side of the border and there's none in Slovakia. But here, in the last episode, we were in the Topolia village with the um, church that wasn't so impressive. Maybe the church wasn't impressive, but next to it was a cemetery with the victims of the First World War exactly. Not enough depression yet? I have not mentioned anything about the civilian population. And uh, let's, just, uh, let's just leave it aside. But there is a place which combines depression with the macabre. There's a little village called Osadne. An interesting detail, there's a kind of a kiosk that's simply opened. You can come in, there are souvenirs, you can just take them and leave whatever you like. So it's a kind of a nice little detail of trust in the human being 
which is interesting considering the history of the place and the main reason why people even come here. Uh, another curiosity, I think it's the only um, village in Slovakia with Orthodox majority. Anyway, being Orthodox, they decided after the First World War to go through the woods and collect all the bones of Russian soldiers. Supposedly they managed to bring here more than a thousand corpses and they laid them out in a crypt, but in a very particular way. And here you are. I think this is the ultimate way to see how horrible the war is. And sometimes people comment, but why would you want me to see it? I think for some of us, names on crosses are not enough. We have to see the massacre in, more, uh, in a more brutal way. And as horrible as the uh, imagery here is, I found this photo, which I think is best to sum up the first, the second world war and any other war ever. And the photo comes now. I'm sorry, but it had to be done. Before we finish, here you have a monument of a huge um, tank battle which took place uh, nearby in a place later called the Valley of Death. And uh, here's the problem. It's not one little valley of death in front of you right now. Valley of death, mountains of death, everything around the Dukla Pass is death. 1914, 1944, within 30 years, thousands upon thousands, hundreds of thousands of people died here. Everything around it is death. And this is pretty much Verdun or Somme of the East. And 99% of us today have no clue about it. But today the Dukla Pass is back to its original meaning. As you can see there are plenty of trucks here. It is still a very important place for trade between North and South. So today it is also a very nice place to um, for trekking, to just walk around the beautiful woods and little hills. But do not forget ever of all the horrible things that happened here, well, not a long time ago, really. Now, my idea was to finish the episode with living mid Middle Ages, but I think, I think it's best to leave this episode be so that we can ponder the evil side of humanity. But I do promise that in the next episode, it's going to be much lighter. We are going to see some living, breathing Middle Ages. We are going to see some very good art and even a bit of Hollywood. So for now, thank you very much for attention and I will see you very, very soon.